All right, Dr. Segrin here, and we are going to start our new unit on coronavirus. Uh, I kind of figure that for environmental science, we might as well talk about coronavirus instead of other environmental issues for the rest of the year, because talking about other issues would be a bit like talking about doing the dishes when the house is on fire. So we'll focus on the house fire right now, which is coronavirus, the global pandemic. And we're going to start today by talking about taxonomy and virology of coronavirus. Uh, taxonomy is referring to how the coronavirus fits in with other viruses and also how we characterize it in terms of other life forms. And virology refers to what a virus is and how it works. So what is a virus? So we'll start with the simple question, what is a virus? Um, there is some debate in the scientific community of exactly what a virus is uh, and if it's alive or not, if we should characterize it to be alive. Uh, the debate stems around the fact that viruses do not have cells and they have no means of survival or reproduction on their own. Every other animal, plant, uh, fungus, bacteria, you name it, uh, that we call life, uh, has cells and also has some sort of metabolism, meaning it eats food or it makes its own food. It um, breaks down food for energy, that kind of thing. Uh, and also everything reproduces. So it makes copies of itself, makes babies, etc. Viruses uh, don't have cells. They rely on other cells to reproduce. So they're kind of like parasites. They take over cells and use them to make more viruses. And because of that, they don't directly do any meta metabolism. Uh, they do not eat food directly or uh, do anything with energy directly. They only take over other cells. Um, so are they alive or not? I, I would consider them to be living. They're made of of roughly the same stuff as other life forms, proteins, fats, DNA, RNA, that kind of stuff. Um, I think there's a, a good thought experiment you can do. If you found something like a virus on another planet or an asteroid, would you say you found life? I think you would. Um, and something really important about viruses, to give you some perspective, is that they are incredibly, incredibly tiny. And we'll talk about how tiny they are here with a video. So this video basically shows you the size of all these different types of viruses. It starts with the rhinovirus, which um, is a bit like a uh, cold virus, I believe, kind of like the common cold. Um, and a polio virus, which caused all kinds of issues a hundred years ago or so. And I'm gonna go ahead and pause it here at the influenza virus, which is a little bit bigger, you can see, than these other viruses. So what, what this video is gonna show you is the different sizes of different things. Uh, but what exact sizes are we looking at so far? So polio virus, it says is 0 0.03 uh, micrometers. Uh, 0 0.03 micrometers, that is what that unit is. The funky U looking thing is a, that stands for micro and then the M is meters. So 0 0.10 micrometers for an influenza virus. Uh, so let's take a, a break real quick and talk about units. Um, this right here is a meter stick. So this is one meter. Uh, it's just a um, roughly arbitrary m measurement that we use in science. Um, and if you take this and divide it up 1,000 times, so you divide this segment, you divide it by 1,000 to make 1,000 tinier units, that is a millimeter. And... A millimeter would be these tiny, tiny little tick marks on this. So these little things right here. And you can see compared to my fingernail, um, you know, a little bigger than the width of my fingernail, but pretty tiny. Uh, that is a millimeter. This smaller ruler is 400 millimeters. Um, if you took one of those tiny, tiny, tiny... Uh, units here. So took one of these little tiny units and divided one of those by a thousand. 
That is a micrometer, or a micron is another word for it. So that, we're talking considerably small. Um, if you notice, the influenza virus is 0 0.1 micrometers. So it's actually smaller than the micrometer, which is already really, really small. And it also means that you could fit, if you lined up influenza viruses, you could fit 10,000 of them in that little space. 10,000 influenza viruses. How big is the coronavirus? It's about the same size. It's 0 0.12 micrometers. Um, so incredibly, incredibly small. Even with a high-powered microscope, you're not going to be able to see uh, this virus. It's incredibly small. And let's keep watching our video to see how it sizes up compared to some other things that uh, like bacteria and cells. We're zooming out here a little bit more. There's our rabies virus, a little bit bigger for a virus. And this crazy looking spider thing is a bacteriophage. They're uh, another type of virus. There's a small tox vi smallpox virus, looks kind of like a raisin. And you can see that there's quite a big jump up to our smallest bacteria. So this would be an actual cell, the smallest cell really in the, in, in terms of all life forms is one micron, very tiny cell, Staphylococcus bacteria. Um, and here's some other bacteria, lactobacillus is another bacteria, E. coli, lactobacillus is in, in milk and yogurt, E. coli you can find in your intestines. And finally, jumping up, that is the smallest cell in your body, which is a red blood cell. And already you can see that our red blood cell completely dwarf, uh, is massive compared to the uh, influenza virus, which you can barely even see anymore on this scale. And this is eight microns uh, or eight micrometers. And actually, it's a pretty small cell. If you zoom out a bit more, this is yeast, the smallest fungus. And finally, we will pause it here at the skin cell. Uh, and this is a pretty average sized cell in the human body. Um, still really, really small. You cannot see it with your eyes. Uh, 30 micrometers, but at this point you can see that um, the virus, coronavirus, is no longer visible, too tiny. So we know cells are small. Viruses are unbelievably tiny, even compared to cells. So there's some perspective uh, on you guys. All right, let's go back to our presentation. And this brings up a, a good point. Uh, in that little video, you could see that there are many different types of viruses in the world. It's not like there is just one type of virus. We saw there's rhinovirus and rabies and polio, smallpox, flu. Um, and the term coronavirus, I think a lot of people don't realize, is actually a family of viruses. Uh, so there are a lot of viruses that we would call coronaviruses. Um, the particular coronavirus that is the pandemic in the world, its official name is SARS-CoV-2. That is what we would call its, its kind of its species name. And you can kind of see why the news and media are going to be using the word coronavirus more so than SARS-CoV-2. Uh, just has a nicer ring to it. But there are all kinds of different coronaviruses. For example, SARS-CoV-1 uh, was a virus from the early 2000s that infected some eight or 9,000 people. Um, and MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, is caused by another coronavirus uh, that's carried by camels. Um, the common cold is the human coronavirus. So if you've ever had a, uh, a short um, sickness where you're coughing, maybe you have a runny nose, you're feeling a little lousy, maybe a slight fever, you have a cold, that is uh, the human coronavirus. So saying coronavirus uh, is not entirely accurate when referring to this. We probably should be using SARS-CoV-2, and you may see that name uh, as you are reading and watching news about this virus. COVID-19, 
you may have also seen, that is not the name of the virus, that is the name of the disease. So if you get sick with SARS-CoV-2 and it infects you, you will the, the name of your disease is COVID-19. So the people in the hospital right now have COVID-19. All these things, you'll hear more about that I just wanted to, to lay out so that you know what the name of everything is as you are reading and hearing stories about these things. Uh, those are all roughly the same thing. Um, and it's also important to note that viruses uh, have the same naming system as any other life form. Um, they fall into kingdoms and phylums, classes, orders, families, genus, and species. Um, and we can uh, actually understand this a little better using uh, my dog here. This is Luna. She's keeping me company in the, the wake of the pandemic. And here's Lopi too. Hey, bub. So uh, just like uh, any kind of organism, any kind of life form, uh, we have this taxonomy and hierarchy of where they fit in. Um, Luna here is a, she's in the animal kingdom, uh, whereas the coronavirus would be in the virus kingdom. Uh, Lulu uh, is um, a vertebrate, she has a backbone. Uh, she's a mammal, so a vertebrate will be her phylum. Hey, Loki, it's okay. Uh, uh, she has a backbone, so she'd be in the vertebrate phylum. Uh, she has hair and can give live birth, which makes her a mammal. So you're in the mammal class. You have these big teeth, which makes you a carnivore. You're in the carnivore order. And um, your family would be the canine family with the rest of dog-like creatures, the wolves and coyotes. And her genus species is, I think it's Canis lupus domesticus, the domesticated dog related to a wolf. So just like any uh, uh, any kind of life form or animal, uh, you can classify it and rank it in these different systems. Viruses are no different. They have their own taxonomy. The coronavirus is a family of viruses. And uh, speaking of which, there are a ton of different families of viruses. For example, if you look at, at Wikipedia, uh, you start looking, there's some 50 or so different viral families. Coronaviruses are just one family amongst all these other types of viruses. And how many types of viruses are there actually out there in the world? I wanted to give you some perspective on this. Um, there are roughly 5,000 mammal species. So mammals are things with fur. Uh, they give live birth. Uh, so things like bears and tigers and elephants and whales and um, Rhinos, dogs, cats, humans, monkeys, all those things are mammals. There's about 5,000 different types of mammals. So 5,000 mammal species. Uh, if you, some scientists have looked into how many total viruses are living amongst these mammal species. It's a very tough thing to estimate. estimate. Uh, and their estimate was 320,000 total mammal viruses. I'll go through a few. The top left here is the flu virus. Top right is the HIV virus, which is related to a simian, uh, uh, SIV, simian immunodeficiency syndrome, uh, uh, or immune, immunodeficiency virus, sorry, um, which is in monkeys. So HIV, uh, bottom left is rabies, bottom right is Ebola, so there are 320,000 different types, different species of viruses just for mammals alone. Uh, that's roughly, so for each mammal, you have something like 60 to 70 different viruses that could potentially live on and in those cells. That's a lot. Something that's also really crazy about viruses is that viruses infect mammals, so elephants and bats and rhinos and humans and dogs. Uh, but viruses can also uh, infect other types of animals, uh, fish and frogs and reptiles, uh, insects, you name it. All of these things have viruses. Even plants have viruses. Uh, fungi, so things like mushrooms would have viruses. Algae, bacteria, 
We find viruses living on all of them. We don't really know how many of all that stuff is on planet Earth. The estimate is there's probably millions of different species of these things, most of which are bacteria. Um, and if we use our same estimate for mammals as all those things, there could be potentially hundreds of millions or even billions of total virus species around the planet. Uh, so big takeaway here is that there are more viruses on Earth than there are anything else. There are more types of viruses, more species of viruses than anything else on Earth. They are incredibly, incredibly diverse um, all over the place. And that kind of begs the question, well, how if there's that many different types, they're that diverse, how many actual viruses are on planet Earth? This is a tough thing to estimate, estimate again, um, but our estimations are unbelievable amounts. Uh, some scientists were just sampling ocean water, and their estimate for how many viruses are in the ocean right now is 10 to the 31, which is a one with 31 zeros behind it. If you wanted to actually call this a number, uh, there is no name for it that I know of. 10 million, 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 million viruses. For perspective, um, if you look at all the stars in the entire universe, not just our galaxy, uh, again, there's billions of stars in our galaxy and there are billions of galaxies out there, unbelievable numbers of stars out in our universe. On Earth, there are a million times more viruses than there are stars in the universe. So if you took all the stars in the universe, you would have to take that number times a million, and that's how many are on Earth, or actually just in the ocean. Um, scientists have also looked in the atmosphere, 10 to the 24, so one million, 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 million uh, viruses roughly in the atmosphere floating around the Earth, and that's not even counting all the viruses that are actually living in organisms. Uh, one person with the flu, if you take about a drop of their snot, it might have something like 1,000 to 10,000 viruses per drop of snot. Sometimes there's extreme cases of 100,000 viral uh, copies in like a drop of blood or a drop of, of snot. So think about all the different things living on Earth, all harboring different viruses. Uh, that number would also be really massive. Um, so that gives you some perspective on how many viruses there are. You know, scientists, when you're talking about the diversity of life, we kind of skip over viruses a lot, but there are way more viruses out there than anything else, both in number and in diversity. So there's a pretty interesting perspective for you. And here on the right, we actually see uh, some poor cell that's being attacked by uh, numerous viruses and the question is that I'm having right now is if there are so many of these viruses on Earth, all around us, in the water we swim in, in the air we breathe, in every animal and plant and fungus and bacteria all over the place, why are we not being infected more by things? And to answer that, we're going to have to get a little bit into the virology of the virus. So actually, what is a virus and how does it work? Um, I've boiled it down to kind of four simple steps. Uh, the diagram to the right here um, has five. I think three and four are kind of redundant. Um, but the idea is that number one thing that has to happen is the virus has to bind to a cell. So the virus is kind of floating around out there and it has to kind of latch onto a cell. Step two a virus injects DNA or RNA into the cell. So after it's kind of stuck to the cell, it shoots this DNA or RNA into the cell. And as a reminder, DNA and RNA are kind of a recipe for life. Um, so every life form on Earth has DNA uh, or RNA. And this DNA and RNA is a recipe to make proteins. And pretty much everything that you're seeing here for me is made of proteins. Uh, most of your body 
besides water is proteins. And so this DNA, by creating these proteins, is actually really creating a life form itself. Um, so it's a recipe for a life form. So this virus is actually injecting its own recipe into this poor cell. So the recipe here is to make new viruses. And the cell doesn't know that it's there. And this DNA is just floating around. And the cell, um, all the, the cellular machinery, um, actually takes the DNA and makes new viruses out of the DNA that's in its cell. So the cell is essentially killing itself by making new viruses. It's pretty sad. Um, and eventually, these viruses have to escape the cell and go infect new cells. And that would be step four here. Um, there are different mechanisms that these viruses can escape, um, but the most common one that uh, you hear about is something called lysis. So literally, so many viruses pile up in this cell, uh, and again, the cell is making the viruses out of the DNA. So many are piling up that the cell just bursts and releases all these viruses, killing the cell in the process. And then the viruses move on to the next cell, and the same thing happens. So slowly over time, more and more cells just die. This gives you perspective of why viruses actually make you sick. If you lose enough cells in your body, you get first you get sick, and then if it gets really, really serious, you can have things like organ failure and death. Um, so that's how viruses go about doing their um, their work. Um, and all that process can kind of help us understand um, our, our bigger question. If there's so many viruses in the world all around us constantly, why are we not just constantly sick trying to fight off these viruses? And the answer is um, the step one, the virus binding to the cell, uh, is extremely specific. Um, each virus has a um, receptor, a binding receptor, we call it, on the outside. This crazy diagram below is the binding receptor for the flu virus, uh, the, the human flu virus. And how this works is that this is a, a mass of different atoms and molecules, uh, proteins, and you name it, all kinds of different things are in this. And it kind of works as a key to a lock. Uh, your cells on the outside have all these little um, things coming in and out constantly. Uh, you have all these little uh, channels on the outside of your cells and all of them um, have to have a specific uh, key to open them up and let things inside. And what this virus does is that this key basically binds to the cell and kind of tricks it into thinking that this is uh, nothing out of the ordinary except it is, it's a virus that then injects its DNA into the cell. And so you can see how complicated this key mechanism actually is. And the vast majority of viruses out there, whether they're in the ocean or the air, when they get in your body, uh, their key just does not work on your cells because it is not designed to work on your cells. Um, and really the only viruses that have the right keys are, you know, the the 50 to 100 that are that are common in humans, you know, flu viruses and cold viruses and uh, enteroviruses and all, that's uh, intestinal viruses. Um, and the rest usually don't work on humans. And that's a good thing. So all these viruses floating around don't do much harm to us. Um, the real only the viruses that we need to worry about are um, these 320,000 uh, mammal viruses uh, in the world. The, the billions and billions of different types of viruses that are for trees are probably not going to do much to your cells. But mammal viruses in general have the opportunity to bind to your cells. And when you're talking about these mammal viruses that could be compatible with humans, um, you might think that a dog and a human are not very similar, but Really, this guy, Loki, my other dog, um, he, they're brother and sister, by the way, Luna and Loki, uh, 
a virus that's compatible with him. Uh, <laughs> um, could be compatible with me. So there are several dog viruses, and most of them don't seem to do much in humans, but it's possible. Uh, when you think about Loki and me, uh, we both have brains and lungs, hearts, skin, hair. Um, all of our organs are the same, stomach, intestines, esophagus, um, all these things, blood, muscles, really are pretty similar. And the cells, if you put them under a microscope, his cells and my cells, they would be very similar looking. Um, the receptors around them might be slightly different, and that's why some viruses would not be able to transfer between the two of us. Um, but we're all pretty similar, uh, all these mammal species. And when a mammal virus typically uh, spreads to a human, we call that zoonosis. Um, that is the spreading of an animal disease uh, to a human, a virus in this case. Um, right now, we don't know if coronavirus can infect um, other animals. Um, and I will probably do another video lecture on the subject of zoonosis. All right, thanks, bud. We think coronavirus came from either a bat or a pangolin. Those are the two closest related viruses that we could find uh, to the one that's infecting humanity right now. And the idea is that um, because we're closer related to these mammals, it is possible that their cells are similar to ours enough that a virus can jump over into a human. Uh, and then once it's in the human, it can be spread from human to human to human. Um, and so it's all about that lock and key mechanism. And this particular virus managed to make the jump into humans. Uh, its binding protein was similar enough that it could bind to our cells. And it's going to infect people. Uh, so that hopefully gives you some perspective on um, viruses and coronavirus uh, moving into the world. Um, Viruses, just to kind of summarize, are unbelievably tiny. They are unbelievably abundant in the world. They um, are incredibly diverse. There are just tons and tons of, di of different viruses out there. And um, most scientists in the know realize that it's really just a matter of time before new viruses cross over into humans. Uh, and that's what happened with this new uh, coronavirus, officially, scientifically called SARS-CoV-2. And that wraps up our discussion of um, coronavirus for today. Uh, hopefully you know more about the taxonomy and virology, and I will talk to you next time. See you later.